Generations ago, in an attempt to combat the rising threat of overpopulation, an expedition was launched from Earth to the vast reaches of space with a singular goal, colonization. The expedition carried 40,000 prisoners, awarded their freedom in exchange for their service as pioneers, along with a vast supply of human embryos. Their destination, the Caprulu Sector, was light years away from the safety of Earth. A rugged, hostile frontier teeming with unidentified life forms. It would be best described to you and I as Space Australia. By the year 2499, mankind, now identifying themselves as Terran, numbered several billion strong in total population, and had settled across most of the habitable planets in the Caprulu sector. But after a series of several small-scale military skirmishes and the political instability of the Guild Wars, the Terran would come under the control of a strict military dictatorship known as the Confederacy, who ruled the Terran worlds with an iron fist from the metropolitan capital planet, Tarsonis. What were the Guild Wars? We will save the specifics for a video on a later date, but the conflict began in 2485. The newly formed Confederacy began making vies for power in the mining colonies, and fearing that the Confederacy would use their military strength to regulate their lucrative operations, the Kalanis Shipping Guild and Morian Mining Coalition would form the Kelmorian Combine and pledged their aid to any mining guild that was threatened by the Confederacy. The Guild Wars would come to an end in 2489, with the Confederacy assuring its dominance in the Caprulu sector. This planet, Chao Sara, would be the first to be seeded by the Zerg Overmine within the borders of Terran space. We, as the player, take on the role of an unnamed Confederate Lieutenant of the Alpha Squadron, tasked with responding to a request by the local magistrate to deal with a faction of extremists known as the Sons of Korhal. Our directive is made clear, take no prisoners. And I'd like to take care of them without involving the local militia. That's where your Alpha Squadron boys come in. There are to be no arrests, Lieutenant. I hope you understand what I mean. I want this problem solved once and for all. Good hunt. Shortly after the battle is joined, our forces find themselves overrun in a fight for their lives against an unknown alien species, who would become known as the rabid alien menace, the Zerg. We've got it coming, and I'll be damned if I can identify them. Whatever they are, you must destroy them, Lieutenant. That is a direct order. SCV, good to go, sir. Roger that. Base Recon is under squad attack. Surplus reporting. We're here to oversee the extermination of these xenomorphs and contain the spread of any hostile infestation on this colony. Before the battle is lost, they are saved from the cold grip of defeat by a shadow unit of Confederate Special Forces, the Cerberus Recon Squad, who make short work of the Xenomorph threat. The Sons of Korhal, defeated, leave Chao Sara behind. The Lieutenant begins to work alongside Cerberus and their commander to evacuate nearby Confederate scientists from the Flanum installation, a laboratory used to study the emerging yet unknown threat of the Zerg. The Flanum scientists, under threat by Zerg attack, are saved by a group of Cerberus firebats the flame-throwing shock troopers who burn the oncoming Zerg forces to a crisp. Slater, we've located the scientists. Naturally. Yes. Let's burn. The security system's all out of whack. Be careful, boys. Naturally. Let's burn. You got it. <laughs> Room secure, sir. Let's burn. Not long after, the Zerg Xenomorphs would attack the planet capital, 
of Los Andares, but of a combined effort of the Confederate Alpha Squadron, under command of Colonel Edmund Duke, would beat back the Zerg and establish a defensive perimeter capable of putting a stop to the alien approach. Now in a position for an offensive strike, the Lieutenant and Cerberus Commander were able to defeat the surrounding Zerg and their nests of Hive Clusters. Their work accomplished, the Cerberus Commander would impose a Class 7 seal on all information surrounding any and all Xenomorph activity. The disclosure of the seal would result in immediate termination. This conversation never took place. We were never here. The fate of Chaosara would be a planet-wide lockdown, and the ensuing propaganda published by the Confederacy would have no mention of the mysterious Xenomorphs. All that would be remembered was the Confederacy's mighty victory over the Sons of Korhal. Despite the Zerg's initial defeat by the Confederate defenses, the Zerg swarm quickly overran Chaosara's defense, killing or infesting the majority of its colonies. The Chaosara colony soon went silent, but the planet would see another alien race darken its skies, the Protoss. And by the reluctant command of the Protoss General High Templar Tassadar, though reluctant, all life would be extinguished on the planet. Our story begins on the planet of Marsara. On December 12th, 2499, days after the Protoss purged all life from Chaosara, the Confederacy appointed a new magistrate to the neighboring fringe world Marsara. This was done in an effort to quell the fears and suspicions of the surrounding planets. You assume the role of that newly instated magistrate overlooking this small colony. After the downfall of Chaosara, the Confederacy tightened its grip and began a military crackdown on all outlying systems and fringe worlds. Now keep in mind that none of these planets have any knowledge of the Xenomorph menace that was responsible for the fall of Chaosara. All they heard was the propaganda about the Confederates' mighty victory over the Sons of Korhal. So this galactic quarantine came unexpected and was very unwelcomed. Soon after your arrival, a message is left with the Magistrate's Adjutant, which is a non-sapient artificial intelligence used for various important functions that necessitates an assistant or military commander. This message was from the recently promoted General Edmund Duke. The contents explained that he has now included Marsara in the Planetary Quarantine Order and now requires the Magistrate to relocate his colonists and his limited amount of military personnel to the wastelands. Naturally, this was unpopular with the colonists and would only be the beginning of colonial unrest with the brutality of Confederate tactics here on Marsara. Can't believe we're being sent to the wasteland. These Confederates think they can push anybody around. The Magistrate's resources are severely limited, and his military forces are composed of only the most basic of soldiers, the SCV and the Terran Marine. The Space Construction Vehicle, or SCV for short, is a small mech measuring about 12 feet tall, built solely for construction and resource gathering. Orders, Captain? Can I read you? Yes, sir? Reporting for duty. Come again, Captain? I'm not reading you clearly. I can't believe they put me in one of these things. And now I gotta put up with this, too? I told him I was claustrophobic. I gotta get out of here. I'm socked in here tighter than a frog's butt in a watermelon seed pipe. This unit, while not a soldier, is constructed out of neosteel with a plasteel view hatch in the front. SCVs have been observed to be equipped with fusion cutters, plasma welders, a power drill, a utility clamp, and also include heavy duty thrusters. Now aside from the SCV, the Magistrate only has access to a single type of offensive unit at this time, the backbone of any Terran military, the Marine. Give me something to shoot. Jacked up and good to go. Are you gonna give me orders? Oh my god, he's whacked. I vote we frag this commander. How do I get out of this chicken shit outfit? 
This hardy infantry unit, wearing a powered exoskeleton and wielding a Gauss rifle, alone is fairly weak. But when united as a large group, they can strike fear into even the most terrifying of foes. A local marshal going by the name of Jim Rayner has agreed to assist in the colonists' relocation and will meet the magistrate's forces en route to the new wasteland quarantine site. Rayner here. Anytime you're ready. This is Jimmy. Hey, quit it. What's your problem, man? Look, Commander, do you mind? I knew I should have stayed in bed this morning. There is a vast change in the environment where the colonists were accustomed to their homes and neighborhoods and various businesses. Now they're all met with desolate stretches of dirt and craggy plateaus. Even animal wildlife seems to be sparse in this new place they would call home. Howdy, boys. I'm Jim Rayner, Marshal of these parts. As the Magistrate's group meets up with the Marshal and begins to strengthen their new territory, they run into an unknown class of unnaturally vicious aliens, which also seem to be devoid of communicative intelligence. And thanks to the stifling propaganda of the Confederacy, they were none the wiser that these vicious aliens were the ones responsible for the fall of Chaosara, and that their presence can only mean that Marsara is now in the same apocalyptic predicament. Thankfully, the enemy numbers are few on the wastelands, and with the heroic efforts of the colonists bolstering the ranks of marines, the aliens are defeated with only minimal casualties. The Magistrate and his people are safe for now. With the combined efforts of the Magistrate and Marshal Jim Rayner, the Wasteland forces were now secure, safe from the alien onslaught for the time being. Yet this momentary peace was not to last. A distress beacon, activated one morning at 0658 hours, echoed across the reaches of space from a nearby colony here on Marsara. Hey, what's up, man? Got your refugees tucked in nice and tight. Provide you can sidestep any more surprises from our Confederate friends and we can keep them away from those critters, they should have an easy time. Priority alert. Backwater station under attack by unknown alien organisms. While the beacon's destination was the Confederate homeworld of Tarsonis, to request aid and reinforcements to fight off the very same unknown alien menace that we had run into, General Duke issues a stern command that neither we nor Marshal Rayner are to do anything in response. He insists that the Confederacy would be issuing reinforcements when able, and that if the situation needed our attention, we would be notified. Knowing that this decision would doom Backwater Station and the many innocents dwelling there, Rayner decides to take matters into his own hands and enact a daring rescue mission. Damn! Listen. If we wait for Confederate reinforcements, that station's dust. I'll head out there now and do what I can. You send in some militia, and we'll save those folks. Trust me. You would not be going alone, as we would be offering a contingent of Marines to support the Marshal in his brave rescue. Glad to see you, boys. Time to kick some serious butt. The safety of the colonists on Marsara is paramount, as we would need all the help we could get for the fights that the future holds. After establishing a small forward base, Rayner makes a peculiar find as he advances on Backwater Station. A bizarre, flesh rot structure protruding from the ground, infecting the surrounding soil with a violet, vile strewn ichor. Pulsing and throbbing, it's as if the ground itself was alive. And what's worse, it seemed to sustain and nourish the hordes of xenomorphs creeping across its surface. Without hesitation, Jim Rayner annihilated the structure and continued into Backwater's city limits. Upon entering the area, Backwater Station's survivors emerged from their bunkers, confirming their dire situation and for the first time, dubbing the alien swarm with an official designation. This should be good. The Zerg. Thanks for the rescue. We've been holding 
holed up in these bunkers for days hiding from the Zerg. I read you. Right away, sir. Anytime you're ready. Orders, Captain? These things have been out here a while, but they could be pretty useful. Orders received. Need a Raider here. While scavenging the remaining defenses of Backwater Station, Rayner gets his hands on schematics for the Engineering Bay and the Terran Academy, allowing major upgrades for the Terran Marines and unlocking the ability to enlist a new type of soldier, a fire battery. Let's burn. Wanna turn up the heat? Yes? Fire it up. Is something burning? <laughs> That's what I thought. I love the smell of napalm. Nothing like a good smoke. Are you trying to get invited to my next barbecue? Got any questions about propane? Or propane accessories? Hot and heavy shock troopers, these blazing badasses boasted more armor than standard marines while wielding twin flamethrowers, capable of roasting, deep frying, and charbroiling any Zerg forces to a crisp at melee range. Yes. This is Jimmy. Anytime you're ready. The Zerg, however, revealed a new species of their own to match. The Hydralisk. A large, serpent-like beast reaching over two meters in height, with wicked flesh scythes for arms, capable of rending limb from limb with ease. Yet their true terror lay in their ability to fire long-range, armor-piercing spines from sockets embedded in their top carapace plate. After heroically blasting through these Zerg forces, Rainer was rewarded with a disturbing sight. What the hell did they do to that command center? A Terran command center, infested by the Zerg to the point of near unrecognizability. Knowing this could only mean trouble, the structure was raised to the ground. Finally breathing a sigh of relief, Rainer and the Magistrate's forces can relax knowing that they have saved Backwater Station from annihilation. Yet this victory was short-lived. Immediately after the enemy forces are routed, General Duke hails Jim Rainer. Marshal Rainer, by destroying the vital Confederate installation, you and your men have violated standing colonial law. As of right now, you're all under arrest. I suggest you throw down your weapons and come peaceably. Are you out of your mind? If we hadn't burned that damn factory, this entire colony could have been overrun. Maybe if you hadn't taken your sweet time in getting here. Now, I asked you nice the first time, boy. I didn't come here to talk with you. Now throw down them weapons. Guess you wouldn't be a Confederate if you weren't a complete pain in the ass. By destroying this vital Confederate installation, Rainer and his company have violated colonial law. Now outlaws placed under arrest by General Duke, Rainer and the Magistrate's militia forces wouldn't be making it back to the wastelands. Hey, 
Looks like you mashed some poor feathers, dog, Sarge. It's a zergling, Lester. Smaller type of zerg. But he can be out this far unless... Oh, shit. After the unjust arrest of Marshal Jim Rayner and the Magistrate's militia by General Edmund Duke, the Magistrate submits numerous appeals on Jim's behalf to get him and our militia forces released. Yet our words fall on deaf ears. General Duke rejects our requests, dismissing our loyalties as misplaced and the ramblings of damn fringe world yokels. I got your message, Magistrate, and frankly, I don't care what you have to say about Confederate regulations. You damn fringe world yokels are all alike. Don't know where your loyalties lie. Y'all have a real good day now, you hear? After the transmission, the adjutant fills us in on our planet's current situation. Sixteen outlying stations on Marsara have come under heavy attack by Zerg forces, and three of them have already fallen. As a precaution, knowing conflict is inevitable, the Magistrate has commanded all of the colonists from the Wasteland into an evacuation zone, in hopes of awaiting rescue. Despite numerous pleas for aid, the Confederacy has refused to send reinforcements, and has even begun actively arresting standing militia forces, just like what happened at the Backwater Station. With any hope of rescue fading fast, the Magistrate reaches out to any and all militant groups that might be able to aid them. And only one response, the Sons of Coral. The adjutant patches us through to their charismatic leader, Arcturus Minsk. Minsk mentions that his group is always on the move, never staying in one spot for long, but he is willing to send an evac team for the remaining colonists that have assembled in the evacuation zone. Despite the propaganda that the Confederacy has issued, painting the Sons of Korhal as barbaric cutthroats, they are not as nefarious as the Confederacy would have us believe. However, Mengsk makes it plain that if the Magistrate accepts their help, all of their forces, civilians included, will be branded as outlaws and henceforth be enemies of the Confederacy. Seeing no other option, the Magistrate accepts Mengsk's deal, and not a moment too late, because within hours, the evacuation zone would be completely overrun by the Zerg swarm. Surveying the situation outside, the Magistrate sees that their defenses have been severely damaged and are in need of repair. Hey, this thing's on fire! You ought to send an SCV out here to repair it! You can fix my bike up too while he's at it! But it's not all bad news, as the Magistrate has also acquired access to a new structure after moving to the evacuation zone, the factory, allowing the creation of various military vehicles and upgrades. While most of its creations are unavailable to us now, there is one vehicle revved up and ready to go. The Vulture. I read you, sir. Something on your mind? What do you want? Something you wanted? I don't have time to fuck around. You keep pushing me, boy, and I'll scrap you along with the aliens. A weaker version of the hoverbike driven by Marshall Rayner this agile scouting unit is capable of firing off salvos of frag grenades, which are absolutely devastating to organic units and light armor. They're also capable of laying a clutch of spider mine, wicked proximity mines that spring out of the ground and sprint to the nearest enemy unit that dares come close, perfect for dealing with hordes of mindless zerg. Not to mention the sound they give off is so satisfying if you're not on the receiving end. With the Sons of Korhal transports about 30 minutes out from touchdown, the meager colonial defenses don't need to hold out for long. Yet the Zerg, ever evolving, have their own new terror to unleash on us as well. The Mutalisk. A worm-like entity which glides over the battlefield on a pair of leather wings, which spews a glaive-like slug projectile from its tail that bounces between its targets.
Against them, our marines would be shredded like newspaper. But luckily, we have acquired building plans for missile turret defense systems. More than capable of bringing down our new flying friends. As evacuation gets closer and closer, we are assaulted by larger and larger waves. The largest force nearly breaching our defenses when help is only about two minutes away. And at long last, after what seems like thousands of Zerg have been slain, the roar of dropship engines echo through the clouds. Sons of Korhal dropships approaching. Strap yourselves in, boys. Our rescue has arrived, and now thanks to the Sons of Korhal, our colonists are safe for now. With our surviving colonists and remaining troops safely off-world, we return to headquarters to tie up the last loose ends on Marsara. Our adjutant confirms that we have lost our title of Colonial Magistrate. Pending investigation of our dealings with the extremist group the Sons of Korhal by Confederate authorities. So from this point forward, we are now referred to as Commander, as we use our tactical prowess to help lead the Sons of Korhal in their fight. As we let the events of the last few missions sink in, we receive contact from our good friend, Jim Rayner. Just like with us, Arcturus Minsk came to the rescue of the tenacious Marshal by sending a strike force to spring him and our militia forces from the Confederate prison ship that they were held on. Rayner mentions that Minsk and his men seem on the level, a potentially powerful ally worthy of our trust and support. It's not long before that promise of support is put to the test, however. Minx delivers the bitter truth that the end of Marsara is at hand. Commander, Marsara is almost completely overrun by the Zerg. The Confederates are abandoning the planet. And so are we. However, there is one thing I'd like to do before we leave. It's only a matter of time before the planet is purged, just as Chausara was. And so the remaining colonists and confederate forces are evacuating as quickly as they can. The level of chaos and disorder presents us with a lucrative opportunity. Key Marsara structures now lie abandoned by the confederacy, save for a skeleton crew of workers and security. One such structure is the Jacobs installation, a secret installation not on any confederate records, built into the side of a mountain. It was built over a massive cavern with walls that are over three meters thick. It was operated by Alpha Squadron, and parts of the installation were heavily automated and defended, with numerous sources of backup energy, and it is without a doubt full of valuable Confederate intel, ripe for the raiding by our newfound alliance. Minsk announces his orders. Infiltrate the Jacobs installation outpost, and extract any weapon schematics we can find so that he might wield them in the fight against the Confederacy. Our strike team of Firebats and Marines is led by Jim Rayner, who, in rare form, has donned his Marine armor for this mission. And I mean, it makes sense. You wouldn't want to hover bike indoors, lobbing grenades in tight hallways and close quarters. Just as Minsk expected, Confederate security within the facility is minimal, with most of the corridors completely empty, save for a few security turrets, and the few hapless SCVs and scientists maintaining the machinery. This is Jimmy. Oh yeah. Teleportation field activated. Right on. Hey, you're not allowed in here. After entering through a lone teleporter deep within, 
Our strike team rifles through the security room, revealing the location of several key rooms ahead of us. The strike team advances to the newly revealed rooms. Neutralizing a portion of the remaining security by turning off an opportune security switch in that first room. Right on. Delving good. deeper into the facility, the team comes across a troubling discovery. Zerg. You rebel scum. Locked within a holding cell across from other indigenous lifeforms found on Marsara. Zerg! I don't believe this! Believe it? I saw Zerg within Confederate holding pens myself, and that was over a year ago. It's clear the Confederates have known of these creatures for some time. For all we know, they could be breeding the things. Be that as it may, our priority here is accessing the Confederate network. We'll deal with the Zerg another day. Manx reveals to us that both he and the Confederacy have known of the Zerg for some time, having seen them in the Confederate holding cells years ago. But why? Manx doesn't know, but suspects it's possible that the Confederacy wants to breed them and use them as weapons. Regardless, the truth of this matter has to wait until we make it out of the facility in one piece. Stepping through one final teleporter, the strike team enters the main control room, guarded by a squad of infantry led by an elite Confederate operative, a ghost. Psychically gifted, brutally trained, and wielding a long-range C-10 canister rifle, these Spec Ops units are feared throughout the sector, and rightly so. Whatever shadowy corner the eerie green light of their visors glows, death is sure to follow. Nuclear launch detected. Fortunately, the ghost falls to Rainer's combat prowess, and our surviving forces are able to get out of their undefeated plans in hand. Just in time, because only 13 hours after getting off-world, a large Protoss fleet under command of High Templar Tassadar descends and unleashes a terrifying planetary bombardment. Just like Chausara, Marsara's grim fate is sealed. All life on the planet is extinguished. With Marsara annihilated, Mansk ushers us towards our next destination, another fringe world at the edge of Confederate influence, the border colony of Antigua Prime. Once we arrive planetside, Captain Rayner confirms that the Sons of Korhal headquarters have begun decoding the data disks secured from the Jacobs installation mission, and that it will hopefully be decrypted soon. Rayner anxiously awaits to see what lies within the data, lamenting that he hopes the lives he lost to secure this information were worth it. Minx begins his briefing. He informs us that our objective on Antigua Prime is to secure more allies against the Confederacy. The Confederacy, weakened by our alliance and the raid on the Jacobs installation, is losing its grip on the fringe worlds. Now other parties are standing up to Confederate tyranny, and we must aid their efforts so that our strength can grow. Minsk then turns the mission briefing over to his second-in-command, Sarah Kerrigan, a ghost who Minsk liberated from the Confederacy some time ago. She confirms that the residents on Antigua Prime are ready for revolution. 
General Duke has caught wind of this descent and stationed a large detachment of Alpha Squadron soldiers near the planet's main colony to keep the peace there. Our mission is not only to free the colony from the Confederate soldiers putting them on lockdown, but to eliminate the Alpha Squadron detachment on the planet as well. If we can do that, the Antiguan colonists will see the courage of our convictions and join our great struggle. Our forces, led by Jim Rayner, rendezvous with Kerrigan nearby before moving forward. Lieutenant Kerrigan reporting. What now? I'm waiting on you. Easily amused, huh? Doesn't take a telepath to know what you're thinking. You get off on annoying people, don't you? You may have time to play games, but I've got a job to do. Upon meeting the beautiful, deadly Sarah Kerrigan, Jim's mind betrays the lewd thoughts that come across his mind upon seeing her. Rainer here. Captain Rainer, I finished scouting out the area and... You pig! What? I haven't even said anything to you yet. Yeah, but you were thinking it. Oh, yeah. You're a telepath. Look, let's just get on with this, okay? Right. As a ghost, Kerrigan is a powerful telepath who has no problem reading Jim's mind like an open book. What's more, her ghost training gives her access to tactical camouflage and a powerful lockdown ability, which is capable of disabling vehicles where they stand. As our forces advance to meet the Antiguan rebels, Kerrigan reveals that the nearby missile turrets can see through her camouflage. and will need to be destroyed, lest she be discovered before the revolution even begins. Soon, our forces arrive at the rebel outpost. Harrigan, stealthing into the Antigua Prime Command Center, assassinates the Confederate officers with deadly efficiency. In doing so, she causes disarray in the Confederate chain of command, allowing the Antiguan rebels to immediately begin firing on the Confederate troops stationed around the base. That's right. We've tolerated these Confederate goons long enough. Base is under This is Jimmy. Go ahead, Commander. Oh yeah. Give me some of this shoot. Raider here. Base is under attack. With the forces of Antigua Prime at our side, we gain access to a new structure with powerful new military units. The Starport which produces aerial vehicles. We received build schematics for dropships when we joined up with the Sons of Korhal. I'm listening. Destination? Go ahead, HQ. When removing your overhead luggage, please be careful. In case of a water landing, you may be used as a flotation device. To hurl chunks, please use the vomit bag in front of you. Keep your arms and legs inside until this ride comes to a full and complete stop. And with the Antiguan Rebels, we acquire the Wraith. Reporting in. Transmit coordinates. Go ahead, Command. Last transmission breaking up. Come back. I'm just curious, why am I so good? I gotta get me one of these. You know who the best starfighter in the fleet is? Yours truly. Everybody's gotta die sometime, Red. I am invincible, that's right. A stealth fighter with powerful air-to-air -air missiles and a burst laser to deal with ground forces. With wraiths and dropships now at our disposal, Captain Rayner and Lieutenant Kerrigan have full air support to take on the Alpha Squadron forces stationed across the river. Go ahead, HQ. Standing by. We break through their lines on the east bank. Their defenses there are weaker due to the abundance of resources. 
We strike where they are vulnerable and rush forward to create a forward operating base. Though their position on the river is well defended from aerial assaults, being assaulted via infantry from the east side of the base was not in their plans. Attack formation. You want a piece of me, boy? Your forces are under attack. Once again, we have bested General Duke, who sounds the retreat for his remaining forces. Antigua Prime is ours. Once again defeated, General Duke retreats, thinking his forces would be safe in orbit above Antigua Prime. But upon escaping the planet's surface, his battlecruiser, the NORAD-2, was ambushed by the Zerg swarm within the planet's atmosphere and forced back to the ground. We enjoy a moment of victory on Antigua Prime, explained to us by our adjutant in our mission debrief. The colony, now being in open revolt against the Confederacy, has left the remaining Confederate forces in a state of mass panic. Their few leftover outposts on the planet are in a state of disarray now that they are fending off rebels on all fronts. While most Confederate transmissions are encrypted, the adjutant intercepts a distress call from an unsecured Confederate line. General Duke calling from Alpha Squadron flagship NORAD-2. We've crash-landed and are being hit hard by the Zerg. Request immediate backup from anyone receiving this signal. Repeat, this is a Priority One distress call. It's none other than General Duke. He and his men are desperately trying to fight off the Zerg, trying to overrun the crashed remains of the NORAD-2. He requests immediate aid from anyone who can give it. If no one comes, Death is certain. In a surprising act of benevolence, Minsk orders Captain Rayner to save General Duke. Jim, I want you to move in and save that base. I'm positive I didn't hear that right. Arcturus, have you lost your mind? Rayner and Kerrigan protest, but Minsk explains that having a Confederate general join the Sons of Korhal could only be a boon to their cause. Listen, I know Duke's a cold-hearted bastard, but an entire colony shouldn't have to suffer for that. Besides, a Confederate general could prove to be a powerful ally. This is an opportunity we cannot miss. I don't like this at all. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm asking you to do it. Begrudgingly, we agree. Yes, sir. Great. Let's get this over with. And accept our new mission. If we're doing this, we better hurry. That ship won't last long against those Zerg. 
Rainer and our forces deploy at the outskirts of an Antiguan rebel base, not far from the crash site of the NORAD-2. The only obstacle standing between us and the General are two extensive Zerg bases. An aerial approach would be suicide, since the crash site is surrounded by several anti-air defenses and a large swath of airborne forces. Our best option then is to approach on foot and crush the enemy bases from the ground. The Antiguan rebels offer us just the structure for the job, the armory. This structure houses numerous vehicle and airship upgrades and provides schematics for a powerful new mech, the Goliath. Go ahead, TACOM. Systems functional. Channel open. Comlink online. Milsec E209 on. Checklist protocol initiated. Running level 1 diagnostic. USDA selected. FDIC approved. Checklist completed. SOB. This upright killing machine, whose frame is entirely composed of Neo Steel, is outfitted with dual machine guns and a salvo of surface to air missiles. Just what you need to show a Zerg swarm where they can stick it. These mechs first made their appearance in the Terran military in 2480 and became integral within all parts of combat in 2485 when their schematics were leaked to the Confederacy which tipped off the start of the Guild Wars. Also a fun fact, their design was based on the ED-209 mech from Robocop, which is pretty cool. With this new weapon at our command, we can turn the tide of the battle against the Swarm of Zerg. We notice that the first entrance into enemy territory is a bit of a choke point, but there is a path on the west side that leads to additional resources and a way to attack the enemy from their flank. By exploiting a bit of strategy, we find our enemies running before us. While we kill more and more Zerg, they also try to destroy the survivors of the NORAD too. But thankfully, there are a couple of SCVs who are able to repair damages when the enemies are slain. Our troops push on, prodding over countless lead-filled Zerg corpses, and turn their bases into piles of wet, sticky pulp. After what feels like our hardest battle yet, Captain Rayner accompanies a battalion that destroys the spore and sunken colonies on the plateau surrounding the NORAD-2. This allows Rayner and a fleet of dropships to make it to the crash site. General Duke, surprised to see us of all people as the only responders to his distress call, is given a choice by Minsk. Saddle up with the Sons of Korhal and ride this new wave of revolution or perish along with the rest of the Confederacy who left him to die. Reluctantly, General Duke agrees. You're about the last folks I expected to show up. What's 
your angle here, Minsk. Our angle? I'll give you an angle, you slimy Confederate piece of sh Jim, enough. I'll handle this. The Confederacy has fallen apart, Duke. Its colonies are in open revolt. The Zerg are rampaging unchecked. What would have happened here today if we hadn't shown up? Your point? I'm giving you a choice. You can return to the Confederacy and lose, or you can join us and help save our entire race from being overrun by the Zerg. I don't think it's a difficult decision. Join forces with you? I'm a general, for God's sake. A general without an army. I'm offering you a position in my cabinet, not just some backwater post. Don't test my patience, Edmund. All right, Mengsk. We got a deal. You've made the right choice, General Duke. I can't believe you're really gonna trust this snake. Don't worry, Jim. He's our snake now. With General Edmund Duke joining us as a powerful new ally within the Sons of Korhal, we have yet another obstacle to overcome. With the rescue of the Confederate General, it looks like we've received some unwanted attention from other Confederate forces in the system. Knowing that Antigua Prime is our current base of operations, the Confederacy has dispatched a massive strike force to our position. They mean to pull us out by the root and crush the Sons of Korhal once and for all. Declaring an emergency meeting, Mengsk has vital intel he wishes to share with us. Greetings. I know you're all concerned about the Confederate strike force. But first, we have a grave matter to discuss. It seems our data disks didn't hold weapon designs after all. Lieutenant Kerrigan will explain. Our science teams have successfully decoded the data disk extracted during the raid on the Jacobs installation. What it contains is much stronger than a mere weapon. It contains information showing the Confederacy knew about and nurtured the rising Zerg menace. Kerrigan clues us into the classified Confederate programs for training those who are psychically gifted into ghosts, a program that she herself was a part of. And further research into the program reveals that ghosts and Zerg operate using similar psychic emanations. Rainer connects the dots that the Zerg would be drawn to a psychic energy of a ghost, especially if they are particularly powerful, like Kerrigan. So the Zerg are here for you, darling? Huh. This keeps getting better and better. Shut up. With this knowledge, the Confederacy began work on a transplanar psionic waveform emitter. A psi emitter, which would have the ability to emit a ghost's psionic signature, but on a much larger scale being able to spread across entire worlds. The emitters broadcast the neural imprint of a ghost, but at a much greater magnitude. These things reach across worlds. The mysteries of Marsara and Chowsara now become clear. They were the testing grounds for this new Zerg weapon. The Confederacy used these Psi emitters to lure the Zerg into isolated containment areas. Your colony, Marsara Commander, was one such location. What are you saying? I'm saying the Zerg are a secret weapon developed by the Confederacy. Minsk explains that long ago, the Confederacy obliterated Korhal, using nuclear weapons to establish their dominance. Now, with these Psi emitters, they can use the Zerg as weapons of mass destruction instead. Just as they destroyed Korhal with nuclear weapons to establish dominance a generation ago, they would use the Zerg to put an end to their other rivals. Only this time there'd be no outrage. Who could suspect the aliens were their creation? No, they'd be lauded as heroes for coming in and destroying the Zerg. It's time the Confederacy paid for its crimes. No one would suspect the Confederacy behind the attacks, since they can come in and clean up the Zerg once they'd purged the planets of any undesirables. But now it's time to give the Confederacy a taste of their own medicine. With Kerrigan's assistance, our mission is to plant a Psy emitter in the heart of the invading strike force. Once the emitter draws the Zerg to the planet, 
the Confederate blockade will be broken, giving us a chance to escape Antigua Prime. Heading on to the battlefield, we find that some of our structures are already under fire by Confederate forces. As we retreat back behind our defensive perimeter, Kerrigan expresses her doubts about our mission. While she believes in the cause of the Sons of Korhal, she expresses that no one actually deserves to be devoured by the Zerg. I'm having doubts about this, Arcturus. I just don't think anyone deserves to have the Zerg unleashed on them. I know you have personal feelings about this, but you can't let your past cloud your judgment. Carry out your orders, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Minsk, knowing Kerrigan's traumatic past, states that now is not the time to dwell on what has happened, but insists that she focus on the task at hand. Orders are orders, so she reluctantly agrees. Once we take stock of our base, we find once again our fighting potential has increased. Now joined with General Duke's Alpha Squadron, we have considerable upgrades added to our disposal. Numerous infantry and vehicle upgrades further than what we could previously do, and they give us a unique structure as well as a couple of new units. Firstly, the Science Facility. The Science Facility has the option of two separate add-on structures, which we hope to see in future battles. It also personally increases our ability to upgrade all weapons and armor for our military units. And finally, it houses multiple upgrades for a new support unit that we have acquired, the Science Vessel. We have you on visual. Transmit orders. Receiving headquarters. I like the cut of your jib. E equals MC. Oh, let me get my notepad. Hmm, fusion, eh? I'll have to remember that. <laughs> Who set all these lab monkeys free? I think we may have a gas leak. Do any of you fools know how to shut off this infernal contraption? Ah, the ship, out of danger. A floating laboratory capable of detecting invisible units and able to use powerful abilities like the defensive matrix. Transmit orders. Commencing. Yes, sir! Move it! Delighted to, sir! Which shields units for a threshold of 250 damage. An EMP blast capable of draining enemy shields and wiping out their energy stores. and irradiate, which causes biological units to break down on a cellular level, causing them to rapidly lose HP while damaging any other biological units in a close proximity. Excellent. Upgrade complete. <laughs> Receiving headquarters. Also, cool side note, before StarCraft was released, the science vessel originally was going to have four legs and walk around almost like a spider. That would have been pretty cool, but I like the way they went with it, flying around instead. But the science vessel pales in strength when compared to our newest arrival, the Terran siege tank. Order sir! Yes, sir! Identify target! Da, 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 I'm about to drop the hammer and dispense some indiscriminate justice. What is your major malfunction? Seeing much attention and praise during the Guild Wars, this powerhouse has the ability to lock itself into the ground and extend its range farther than any other unit on the battlefield. But just as this big boy enters our ranks, we see that the enemy is deploying them against us on the outskirts of our base. This will be a fair fight. Immediately, we are assaulted by various waves of infantry, vehicles, cloaked wraiths, and enemy siege tanks. We, as the commander, are pushed to our tactical limits. But we push forward, and establish a strong forward base, using high ground and our new tanks to keep the enemy at bay.
As we dive forth into the heart of their base, we see that they've even deployed Terran battle cruisers into the fray. These aerial titans boast the strongest combination of durability, armor, and weaponry the Confederacy has at their disposal, able to wipe out multiple units just by themselves. But we will not be defeated. While keeping the enemy forces distracted, with Kerrigan's assistance, we are able to sneak an SCV into the middle of the Confederate base and trigger the Psy emitter. The Zerg are coming, and the battle is won. While this Pyrrhic victory ensures our survival for now, Kerrigan pleads to Minsk that this be the last time we use such a depraved weapon. But Minsk replies that, at this point, what we do now, we do for the survival of our species, and that our responsibility is too great for us to do anything less. I am in place. Just promise me we'll never do anything like this again. We will do whatever it takes to save humanity. Our responsibility is too great to do any less. With Antigua Prime overrun by the Zerg, and all surviving life on the surface annihilated by the Protoss fleet commanded by High Templar Tassadar, we have no choice but to move on to the next stage of Minsk's vision for the galaxy. In light of our recent discovery of Confederate secrets, Minsk aims to take the fight to the Confederate homeworld of Tarsonis. The Confederacy has never been this vulnerable before. Having recently thrown away several armies trying to take us out on Antigua Prime, and having lost one of their most decorated generals, Edmund Duke, who now fights for our cause since we saved his life from the Zerg, there may never be a better time to strike. So the Sons of Korhal deploy into orbit above Tarsonis. But first things first, before we can touch down on the planet's surface, we have to break through the planetary defense platform. We meet up in the war room with Raynor, Minsk, and Duke, so that Duke can brief us on the state of the Confederate defenses. General Duke explains that he has defended Tarsonis in over 30 major battles, and that he's confident in assaulting the central platform full force, instead of using some sneaky tactic or ploy to get through. General Duke will brief you. I've defended Tarsonis in over 30 major battles, so I know its defenses inside and out. There are three primary orbital platforms that serve as staging areas for the Confederate fleet. If we assault the central platform, we should cause enough of a ruckus to allow a small force to break through the planetary defenses. He advises that the best approach would be to hit the central defense platform with an overwhelming assault. Smashing through this would cause enough disruption in their defense network that we could penetrate the blockade and land our forces planet side. General, I'm impressed. I never figured you for the frontal assault type. Rainer snidely remarks how uncharacteristic of Duke it is to get his hands dirty with a direct attack, and whether through his own bullish ignorance or the need not to give Rainer the satisfaction of getting on his nerves, Duke plays it off as a compliment. Well, the Confederates have Omega and Delta Squadron troops defending the platform. And they're nothing compared to my Alpha Squadron boys. <laughs> right. He boasts about how his Alpha Squadron troops would make short work of the lesser Omega and Delta Squadrons that are stationed on the central platform also seeming to forget that every time we have gone up against the Alpha Squadron, we have sent them home with their tails between their legs. Duke leads the charge into this fight, at the helm of his Behemoth-class battlecruiser, the fearsome NORAD-2 that we helped save a few missions ago. I haven't got all day. Well? What? Make up your mind. Been a general for 15 years. Now I'm taking orders from a pup. This core hull outfit's a mess. Y'all need some good old fashioned discipline. That's what you need. Duke also deploys a contingent of Confederate ghosts into the mission, opening up this type of infantry for our future endeavors. I'm here. Finally. 
Call the shot. Ghost reporting. You called down the thunder. Now reap the whirlwind. Keep it up, I dare ya. I'm about to overload my aggression inhibitors. These stealth units boast the same C-10 canister rifle as Kerrigan, albeit a weaker version due to less modifications, and possess the same personal camouflage and lockdown ability. But they also wield a devastating weapon we have yet to use, the tactical nuke. Nuclear launch detected. As our forces move forward onto the central platform, Duke finds several abandoned structure attachments. I can't believe this. Half a squadron never would have left us equipment behind. That's what I call sloppy. Putting these to good use, we establish our perimeter and ready our offensive. SCB, good to go, sir. Job our first opponents are the aforementioned Omega Squadron and their heavily fortified front line. Bunker turret systems and siege tanks surround their base perimeter. Their defenses mean little, however, as our ghosts can simply vaporize their defenders with the deployment of a long-range nuclear blast. Piece of me, boy. You want a piece of me, boy? I'm all over it. I'm here. Nuclear Never launch know what detected. Hit him. Nuclear launch detected. Omega Squadron structures are toast, and the only survivors are the ones lucky enough to be hiding inside the base's bunkers. Unluckily for them, our forces move in the moment the nukes go off, not giving them a moment to catch their breath. Soon enough, Omega Squadron is no more. With Omega gone, we are free to take over their resource cache and begin creating troops to move against Delta Squadron. While Omega Squadron consolidated its forces right around its resource cache, we find that Delta Squadron has done the opposite. They have spread out on their side of the orbital platform, creating several defensive outposts with several troop patrols. It will take more than just a couple well-placed nukes to take down this enemy. Next, we advance towards the fortified position of Delta Squadron. What they lack in defenses and fortified lines, they make up for with tactical troop deployment. Stray defensive structures make flanking a challenge, and their ability to reinforce their areas under attack with reserve troops could have made this a difficult fight. But while they have a defensive advantage, you can see that they have grown comfortable on their defensive platform. Go, go, go. Hey. 
They are not nearly as competent as our veteran forces who have faced the burning forge of war and lived to make it this far. By using their choke points to our advantage, we are able to eliminate them without much issue. After the central platform is cleared of the Confederate forces, Duke sends a message to command stating that his mission is complete. This is Duke. The emitters are secured and online. Kerrigan and Rayner, both having been left in the dark about the use of psi emitters, are not pleased. Who authorized the use of psi emitters? I did, Lieutenant. What? The Confederates on Antigua were bad enough, but now you're going to use the Zerg against an entire planet? insane. She's right, man. Think this through. Mengsk explains that he has considered the moral implications of this tactic and insists we carry out our orders. I have thought it through. Believe me. You all have your orders. Carry them out. The moral landscape of this war is shifting now that the sons of Korhal are establishing their power. Have we helped liberate Terran space from Confederate tyranny? Or have we merely installed a new dictator to pull the levers of Confederate power? Someone even more willing to rule by fear? We don't know, but for now, we have no choice but to keep fighting. After Duke positions the Psi emitters on the central orbital platform above Tarsonis, the Zerg wastes no time in overrunning the planet. Billions of them enter Confederate space, overwhelming any city or defensive outpost on Tarsonis within hours. Most of the planet's population is wiped out in only a couple of days. All industrial areas, residential zones, and even the capital, Tarsonis City. That's right, the capital of Tarsonis is Tarsonis, the place so nice they named it twice. All these places are infested by the Zerg menace, but where the Zerg go, the Protoss follow, and soon a fleet of Protoss warships, presumably a scouting party for the massive fleet on the hunt for the Zerg, appear in space near the planet and set a course for the primary hive cluster on one of the orbital platforms. Mengsk fears that if the Zerg are harmed, then there is a chance that the Confederacy could survive. If they engage the Zerg, the Confederates may escape. Manx believes he cannot let this happen. He demands nothing less than absolute victory over the Confederacy. He tasks Kerrigan with two objectives for this mission. Defeat the Protoss scouting party, and ensure that absolutely no Zerg structures are destroyed by the Protoss forces. Commander, send Lieutenant Kerrigan with a strike force to engage the Protoss. Captain Raynor and General Duke will stay behind with the command ship. First you sell out every person on this world to the Zerg. Then you ask us to go up against the Protoss. And you're going to send Kerrigan down there with no backup? I have absolute confidence in Kerrigan's ability to hold off the Protoss. Raynor is furious. He's appalled that Mengsk is using the Zerg as a weapon, just as the Confederates did. And that now we're fighting the Protoss to protect the Zerg, of all things. Furthermore, Mengsk is sending Kerrigan in alone on this suicide mission with no backup. This is bullshit. Kerrigan, are you reading this? I heard. I'm going down there. Arcturus knows what he's doing. Kerrigan tries to calm Rainer down. She still believes in Mengsk and has faith in his ideals. She will carry out this mission dutifully, as she has all others. Defeat is not an option. I can't back out on him now. Funny. I never thought of you as anyone's martyr. 
As her strike force descends to the orbital platform and begins setting up a base, Rainer hails Kerrigan again. How are you doing this, Kerrigan? Look, I know about your past. I mean, I've heard the rumors. I know you were part of those experiments with the Zerg, that Mengst came and saved you. But you don't owe him this. Hell, I saved your butt plenty of times. He knows enough about her past to know that she feels indebted to Minsk, but not at the cost of her own life. Rainer explains that he's saved her a few times himself, but would never dream of asking this of her. Kerrigan asks him to relax and reassures him that she's doing this for more than just Minsk. Jimmy, drop the knight in shining armor routine. That suits you sometimes. Just not, not now. I don't need to be rescued. I know what I'm doing. The Protoss are coming to destroy the entire planet, not just the Zerg. I know that because, well, I just know it. I am a ghost, remember? Once we've dealt with the Protoss, we can do something about the Zerg. Arcturus will come around. I know he will. The Protoss are coming to destroy the entire planet, not just the Zerg. If she can use her psychic abilities to connect with and understand both the Zerg and the Protoss, she could save the planet and understand them both on a level we never have before. Reluctantly, Raynor gives her his blessing, and she begins her mission. I hope you're right, darling. Good hunting. This mission is fought on two fronts. To ensure the Zerg's survival, Kerrigan has placed her encampment directly between both of the alien forces. On one side of her base, the Zerg steam forth, as vicious as ever. Your forces are under attack. Stay cool, Commander. Remember the plan. The Zerg are to remain unharmed. Our best option there is to maintain the defensive line, while on the other side we deal with the Protoss, in our first ever encounter with the species. A mystical, otherworldly alien race. Their technology is sufficiently advanced so as to be magic to us. What's more, their strength is undeniable with just one of their zealots being a match for several marines. Thankfully, Kerrigan has been allowed access to the ultimate expression of Terran might, the battle cruiser. Receiving transmission. Good day, Commander. Hailing frequencies open. Identify yourself. Shields up, weapons online. Not equipped with shields. Well then, buckle up. We are getting way behind schedule. I really have to go, number one. These flying fortresses boast incredible defenses, as well as devastating weapons, capable of blowing both air and ground targets to smithereens. And they can use the Yamato gun for devastatingly long-range energy blasts. While they can only use one blast at a time before their energy needs to recharge, one Yamato blast is more than enough to deal with most foes. Set the course. This battle is unlike any we have ever faced before. There's not even a moment's peace as we constantly need to keep reinforcing our defensive front while offensively marching forward with the other. The Protoss are fascinating. Their structures seem to be based on some sort of warp technology. Where the Zerg structures pulsate and bleed, and our own structures catch fire and explode, their structures seem to hum with energy and mystical tech. The first of the Protoss bases is raised to the ground after we overwhelm them with sheer numbers. They may be individually powerful, but this scouting party was not prepared for our kind of numbers. Plus, I'm sure they're surprised to see us protecting the abominable Zerg. We amass even more Marines for the next enemy base. We are not sure of the level of resistance in the final Protoss base, but it's safe to be prepared. And the Zerg seem to be not attacking as much now. Perhaps they are distracted with something.
We begin our march into the second enemy base, and strangely the resistance is minimal. The base's defenses consisting mostly of photon cannons. There are a few zealots, but other than that, this base seems almost abandoned. And without much effort, we raise the second Protoss encampment to the ground and evict them from the orbital platform. But our victory is bittersweet. Once the Protoss are routed, almost as if they sensed their disappearance, the Zerg surge forth in numbers never before seen. Merciless and unceasing, they break upon our defensive perimeter and begin to shatter our lines. Kerrigan reaches out for immediate evac, but in vain. Manx has no plans of rescue. the Protoss, but there's a wave of Zerg advancing on this position. We need immediate evac. Belay that order. We're moving out. What? You're not just gonna leave us! All ships, prepare to move away from Tarsonis on my mark. Evac? Damn you, Arcturus. Don't do this. It's done. Helmsman, signal the fleet and take us out of orbit. Now. Commander. Jim? What the hell's going on up there? The road we walked to get here has been long, and in walking it, we are no longer the person we were before. It feels like only yesterday we were a fresh-faced Confederate magistrate fighting to establish peace in the chaos of the fringe worlds. No fear of being slaughtered by the Zerg Swarm, no terror at seeing Protoss warships darken the sky. Now we are a master of warfare caught up in the swells of galactic revolution, and at our hand, the Confederacy is no more. How many planets, how many billions have been lost to the Zerg's hunger or to the Protoss's callous genocide? And what was it all for? Mengsk has proven his own cursed humanity, that he is no better than the Confederates he's overthrown. Another tyrant making the people who trust him mere cogs in the machine of his grand design. But a man always has a choice, and just because he believes himself our superior, that doesn't mean we have to be complicit in his tyranny. Innumerable souls he has sacrificed in his name, 
including his most faithful lieutenant, Sarah Kerrigan. For Rainer, enough is enough. He wants out, and he wants us to go with him. I'm gone, and you better come with me. There's no telling who Arcturus will screw over next. Any one of us could be Manx's next necessary sacrifice. As the Sons of Korhal convene in the Hyperion, the adjutant confirms that all contact with Kerrigan's forces in New Gettysburg has been lost. The fleet has lost contact with the ground forces at New Gettysburg. General Minsk has ordered the immediate disengagement of the Korhal fleet from the Tarsonian system. As the Korhal fleet prepares to leave Confederate space, Minsk sends his congratulations to us, his voice beaming with pride at what horrors we have wrought. Gentlemen, you've done very well. But remember that we've still got a job to do. The seeds of a new empire have been sown, and if we... As Minsk begins to wax poetic about having sown the seeds of a new empire, Rainer cuts him off and shuts down his moment of triumph. Oh, to, uh, to hell with you! Immediately, Minsk becomes cold. You're making a terrible mistake. Don't even think to cross me. Icily reminding us that he has sacrificed much to get this far, and that he will not abide traitors. I have sacrificed too much to let this fall apart. You mean like you sacrificed Kerrigan? Rainer shoots back the betrayal is exactly what he did to Kerrigan. You'll regret that. It's become clear that on the path Minsk is going down, he has no intention of letting anyone stand in his way. You don't seem to realize my situation here. I will not be stopped. Not by you, or the Confederates, or the Protoss, or anyone. Intoxicated by his own power, he would rather burn all he has done to cinders, rather than allow anyone to threaten his new regime. I will rule this sector, or see it burnt to ashes around me. If you try to get- As Manx begins to monologue about how much of a villain he has become, the adjutant alerts us that our forces are ready to move out. Rainer immediately cuts the feed, silencing the mad tyrant mid-speech. The fleet is prepped and ready, Commander. Awaiting orders. The hell with him. We're gone. There's no rest for the weary, and before we can make our escape, there is one more obstacle put in our way by the good General Duke. It appears that General Duke has successfully activated Tarsonis' primary defensive weapon, the Ion Cannon. The cannon must be shut down if any escape attempt is to be made. As we ready our ships to depart, the adjutant informs us that General Duke has reactivated a long, silent Confederate weapon, the Ion Cannon. This gargantuan planetary defense battery can drop any ship near Tarsonis out of orbit with its ionic blasts. Mengsk never had any intention of letting us leave alive. In an ironic twist, we must now fight through the sons of Korhal's forces, those soldiers we once fought beside. Hey, Commander, looks like we're on our own. It's funny. Seems like yesterday Arcturus was the idealistic rebel crusader. Now he's the law and we're the criminals. Kills me to know that we helped him achieve his goals of conquest. Rainer reflects that it feels like only yesterday that Minsk was a symbol of rebellion, a new justice to rally behind. We, in our naivete, helped him realize his goals, and we'll never be able to undo that cold reality. Rainer's last words to himself before entering the battlefield are those of regret. Regret over the fate we sleepwalked Kerrigan into. Damn it. I shouldn't have let her go alone. Our vanguard is small, but ready to assess the crucible now in front of us. On one side, General Duke and his Alpha Squadron, and on the other, Mengsk's elite guard. While we could drive deep into their forces and try to wipe out their bases, we recognize that a more tactical approach would be an all-out blitz on the orbital platform where the Ion Cannon is housed. With the full array of the Terran military industrial complex at our disposal, nothing is impossible. After all, Minsk only got this far because of our rapid cunning and strategic dominance. Let's see how he likes it when we turn it against him. Given our circumstance, we decide to completely rout the enemy forces. If Minsk wished death upon our forces, 
and we shall return the gesture on all those he sends before us. Immediately, we are assaulted by enemies from both ground and air. Science vessels deploy to irradiate our infantry, while ghosts infiltrate unseen and devastate us with nuclear fire. Excellent. Let's roll. Affirmative, sir. Excellent. Affirmative, sir. And lockdowns to immobilize our vehicles. We are undaunted. Rainer rallies our men as we shake off wave after wave, never giving in to defeat. We move a small squad north to begin an expansion and get us close to dealing with General Duke. In an almost nostalgic sense, we decimate the Alpha Squadron. Duke has never been able to compete with our strategic guile, and once again, we wipe out his troops. Between nukes, a rush of infantry, and artillery support, their base falls quickly. With his pet out of the way, Manx stands no chance. We bring a couple battle cruisers into the foray and see his so-called elite guard fall before us. The ion cannon platform itself has a perimeter lined with missile defense systems, along with a few infantry units as the last bit of defense. Our scouts initially reported a bigger resistance, but those troops must have been spent attempting to stop us. Our determination is not broken. We keep up the assault and finally level the ion cannon. With it out of commission and the skies clear, we break through the core hall blockade and jump away from the space around Tarsonis. The future uncertain. All we can do now is turn our backs on Minsk's newfound Terran Dominion. The cold quiet of space reminds us that both Raynor and ourselves must decide who we really are what we fight for, and to prepare for the dark future ahead.
fellow Karens, I come to you in the wake of recent events to issue a call to reason. Let no human deny the perils of our time. While we battle one another, divided by the petty strife of our common history, the tide of a greater conflict is turning against us, threatening to destroy all that we have accomplished. It is time for us as nations and as individuals to set aside our long-standing feuds and unite. The tides of an unwinnable war are upon us, and we must seek refuge upon higher ground lest we be swept away by the flood. The Confederacy is no more. Whatever semblance of unity and protection it once provided is a phantom, a memory. With our enemies left unchecked, who will you turn to for protection? The devastation wrought by the alien invaders is self-evident. We have seen our homes and communities destroyed by the calculated blows of the Protoss. We have seen firsthand our friends and loved ones consumed by the nightmare Zerg. Unprecedented and unimaginable though they may be, these are the signs of our time. The time has come, my fellow Terrans, to rally to a new banner. Lies strength. Already many of the dissident factions have joined us. Out of the many, we shall forge an indivisible whole, capitulating only to a single throne. And from that throne, I shall watch over you. From this day forward, let no human make war upon any other human. Let no Terran agency conspire against this new beginning. And let no man consort with alien powers. And to all the enemies of humanity, seek not to bar our way. For we shall win through, no matter the cost.